you have to ask yourself that. If you're saying you're making art for the working class and the working class is not engaging in your art or your community is not engaging with your art, are you actually making it for your community? C.R. Pollock, also known as Dave, is a musician, a Catholic worker, and is a relatively new student of revolutionary communism. We're really excited to talk with Dave today. Uh, Dave actually has a recent album that was put out, I think in 2021, called Call the Dogs Off. I love it. I really enjoy it. I definitely want you all to check it out. But Dave is not here to talk about his wonderful music. Uh, but we're actually going to discuss Ma one of Mao's speeches, and it's called Talks at Yenin Forum on Literature and Art. It's a phenomenal speech. I really, if you have any interest in art, if you enjoy art, and or if you are an artist yourself, I highly recommend, go to the show notes, I'll link it there. And today we're going to discuss kind of four main topics, the class, character, and politics of art. Then we'll discuss the role of cultural revolution in the work of revolutionary artists in a struggle for national liberation and proletarian democracy. We will visit how Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, or revolutionary communism can practically enable justice and liberation minded artists to effectively love their neighbor and genuinely serve the people. And at the end, we're going to wrap it up, uh, returning to the question of how revolutionary artists should understand their relationship with the people that they create art for. This is a really fun conversation. I learned a lot, both from the texts that we studied for this conversation and from the discussion itself. But as you'll notice, I think it was in like question two, we were actually going to also mention the relation between cultural revolution and the armed struggle, which we apparently just completely spaced. We just kind of got caught up in the conversation. so. Um, we didn't get to that, so I thought I'd throw out some wisdom from Mao that he actually shares in this speech, again called Talks at Yenin Forum on Literature and Art. Quote, In our struggle for the liberation of the Chinese people, there are various fronts, among which there are the fronts of the pen and of the gun, the cultural and the military fronts. To defeat the enemy, we must rely primarily on the army with guns. But this army alone is not enough. We must also have a cultural army, which is absolutely indispensable for uniting our own ranks and defeating the enemy." End quote. So generally speaking, the armed struggle is principal, while the cultural struggle is secondary. And yet it is so, so important. I hope you all enjoy this conversation again with DCR Pollock, AKA Dave, on revolutionary art and cultural revolution. And before I let you go, let's remember that the sermon or the homily is a form of art. The poem is a form of art. The woodworker, the dancer, the graffiti artist, the graphic designer, right? So many more of us are actually artists than we often think of. And so it's not just musicians or painters that are artists and, and especially I just wanted to name that because if you write sermons for a community week after week after week, you're also doing a form of art. And so let's broaden our understanding of art and hopefully wield our creative capacities for the work of love, justice, and liberation. Tune back in a week from now and Chris and I are going to dive into Holy Week with you. Enjoy. Is any artistic creation beyond the class struggle? Why or why not? And what's the difference between bourgeois or liberal art and revolutionary art? And Dave, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Yeah, quick answer, uh, no. But uh, like the quote that Mao has in the actual speech, there's no such thing as art for art's sake, art that stands above class, art that is detached 
from or independent of politics, mm. right? So that's that's quick answers. No, there's no art uh, beyond the class struggle. Now, the big question is why? Um, if you want to go first on that, I I could piggyback off that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say that in a class society, right, or in, especially in a world of imperialism that's divided into semi-colonized producing nations and imperialist appropriating nations, the fundamental struggle between classes, right? We have colonizers and the colonized, between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. This struggle, this relationship is the primary determinant of life for everyone, for for. Uh, all people in a particular country, but also across the world in general. This is right. This is a claim as a as historical materialist. So none of our thoughts, none of our artistic creations, our ideas, hobbies, or even prayers transcend or escape this fundamental reality, this this material struggle. And because we move and find our being in a world fundamentally shaped by this class struggle, artistic creations either serve in the interest of the bourgeoisie or the proletariat, right? the, the semi-colonial country or the imperialist country. Yeah, because all art comes from your idea of how you see yourself and how you see the world. So your perspective, your worldview, your ideology that you have in and under capitalism has been well crafted for you from your birth. And unless you are actively challenging your perspective of the world that has been given to you, you are submitting to power. So it goes like class war has been forced upon us. You don't get to opt out of it, Mm -hmm. right? Unless you are actively fighting it, you are submitting to it. Yeah, no, I, I would say like, Dave, as you are an artist, I, I wouldn't consider myself as an artist, but you're an artist. And so everything that you're creating is fundamentally within the reality of the class struggle. It, it yes. doesn't matter whether you move out into the mountains and you build yourself a little cabin and, and you think you're outside of the class struggle or whether you live downtown in L.A. Um, you are firmly rooted in the class struggle. You can't escape it. And we're, we're in a world where this war is happening. And so everything that we are producing artistically is serving either one of the two sides. Yeah. And yeah, it essentially gets down to, was it like, I, I know in recent, there was a huge statement that was being proclaimed during Black Lives Matter, right? If you are not saying anything or you're not actively participating, you are submitting to the state, right? You are submitting to power. I think that's the whole notion behind it. To what degree you are doing it, I think the big thing is that it's not always intentional. Essentially, those who say I don't have an ideology are usually those who are most steeped in it. Mm. That's a long winded answer saying, no, everything you are producing is re- reinforcing some type of perspective and worldview. So we'll get into like the difference between bourgeois liberal or you phrase it interesting. I want to address this. You say revolutionary, but you don't say proletarian. This is an interesting thing that uh, Bogdanov talks about. Very interesting. He's an early Bolshevik writer. Um, well, I know one of his works is just recently translated the working class in art. It's incredible, but it's very specific time. But he talks about this where just because it's proletarian does not mean it's revolutionary. Right? Just as though, just beca- because, uh, same thing with most proletarian folks you know. Just because they're a working class does not mean they're revolutionaries. Sure, sure. Same thing comes from art that is proletarian. Now, there's different things that he talks about. There can be re- reactionary proletarian art, but essentially, art cannot be situated outside of class. But it does not mean it belongs to one particular class, mm. right? Um, so, a good example of this is somewhere like Tolstoy, aristocratic class from the aristocracy, but his art serves the peasantry, right? So you have mixed class art. You do have these things. So you do come across these rare moments of like someone, like uh, someone from what we call them class traders. That's like another word to put it. We have class trader art, right? And you have to, we'll get down to like, it's who it serves is what is most important. Bogdanov and like a lot of the revolutionaries um, specifically after 
the first initial revolutionary period, like when, like when the proletarian state is established, there's this push to have what we call pure proletarian art, right? Or pure proletarian culture, art from the proletariat, serving the proletariat and reemphasizing that. So it was like, again, this is a massive conversation. So stop me if I start derailing, but. Well, I think, I think an interesting point here is that you're naming that the class position of the artist, the class position of the, the creator does play a factor. The experiences of the artist or the creator <clears throat> does shape the kind of art that they do produce, but you can be a petty bourgeois artist. And by that, I mean, if you do not go sell your labor to some kind of producing employer day in, day out for wages, for survival, then you're not a working class member, right? Um, <clears throat> Chris, you're a you're a part-time pastor, part-time chaplain. You're not proletarian. You're not in the working class. And someone who may – they might be like a, a student right now and an artist. They're not in the working class. They're not directly producing the thing that society needs. They're perhaps in the petty bourgeois. They may even be a teacher somewhere out there. Or, But both the intent and the material effect of their art, that is what determines the character of the art. So, mm-hmm. so I would say that there are three main things that differentiate between this bourgeois liberal artistic creation and a revolutionary artistic creation. Number one, it's ideology. Dave, you said that already, right? The ideology of the creator does, in in large part, really drive and determine the kind of art and the purpose of the art that's being created. Number two is the intent, right? You you have to intentionally uh, and consciously create art for certain ends. And then thirdly is the material outcome and effect really does matter. We can't just intend to to create for these particular outcomes. They need to be grounded materially, not not uh, I, ideally or abstractly. Like yeah. thinking of myself as a revolutionary artist because I said something about revolution in, in a poem, right? No, it has to be uh, materially and concretely effective. Yeah. Its intent needs to be revolutionary. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Because sometimes you come across artists who their intent might not have been revolutionary, but the material analysis and depictions they lay out do serve the revolution. For sure. Right. Mm -hmm. If you and we'll we'll get down to that. Uh, Ingalls actually has a bit to say about that subject. But I want to get down to um, the distinctions between essentially uh, bourgeois, petite bourgeois and proletarian art. Is it true that liberal art encompasses both bourgeois and petty bourgeois art, or is there a distinction to be made there? That, I've never thought of that. So, so whenever you talk about the petty bourgeois art as, as yeah. differentiating itself, as individualistic, as trying to prove its particularness, you know what I mean? That mm-hmm. sounds to me like liberalism. Yeah, so I let me clarify, I am either for better or for worse, clumping liberalism in as like kind of an umbrella term for these bourgeois and petite bourgeois ideologies mm-hmm. um whether that's absolutely correct someone can chew me out in the dms later but at least that's how i've understood it that, that makes sense you <laughs> yeah i i got double canceled that makes and sense I, I i see them yeah. as a unity as well I, yeah mm-hmm. that's I, at least in my understanding my own personal notes i want to throw in here um something i picked up a lot it's how the city is viewed, like the urban areas, petite bourgeois and just bourgeois, they view the city as essentially a playground, an escape. Whereas most folks who work in the city do not view it as an escape. It's not a playground. It's a place where you suffer. It's a place where you're constantly, like, you're constantly trying to pay rent. It's where you work. It's not where you play. So these are very distinct uh, tones that you find in bourgeois art. And you're saying that because you have experience working in warehouses with folks who are literally paycheck to paycheck in the cities. Yes, I am currently paycheck to paycheck in the city. Mm. uh, And it is not a place I view as an escape. 
if I may, Chris, I do want to hear that second follow-up question, but I do think that is a a brilliant and beautiful example of different class positions, different class ideologies, because among certain people who have internalized, they may not be petty bourgeois themselves, and especially they're not bourgeois. I don't know. I don't know any people who are actually in the bourgeoisie because they've segregated themselves away from the likes of my kind. But especially among white communities, white working class and and white petty bourgeois communities, there is this this imagining of the city as something beautiful and playful. And look at that sky rise. What a beautiful sky rise. When I see that sky rise, I see I see the concentration of my enemies. Right. This is this is a this is a place of of exploitation, of death, of suffering. Would you just look at those finance buildings? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I think that was a great depiction uh, of when you see a space, when you see a, a city, when you see communities as either play or a place of, of your own. Yeah, your own toiling, your own exploitation, your own struggle that can really reveal the class ideology that you have. Do you have a proletarian, a working class ideology or do you have a more petty bourgeois um, ideology? So that, that's a great depiction. Um. So I'm supposed to bring up three people, Ingalls, Mao, and Hemingway, for three specific reasons. Ingalls talks a lot about content. The three main points he gets across of like what Marxist content at its very bare minimum should be is promotion of class consciousness and the irreconcilability between the proletariat and the bourgeois, basically the difference between them, promote the contradictions of capitalism, and then also... The idea that capitalism has not always been here and will not always be here. So that's Engels' takeaway with a lot of this. And then Mao, where he gets at, uh, he gets a little bit more specific with content. Essentially, the only way to write well on content is to know the subject. If anything, I want to drive this home the most. Revolutionary art is the product of the brains of revolutionaries. How do you make good revolutionary art is first and foremost you must be a revolutionary it reminds me of this quote from saint augustine where it says love god and do whatever you please right like what is the christian life first and foremost love god and then do whatever you want how do you make revolutionary art first and foremost be a revolutionary then write about whatever you want because everything you come up everything that comes out of your pen will be revolutionary. Essentially, uh, from the bunch of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeah, I think that's a great example. I, I like that. Yeah, why I bring up Hemingway is because he, I'm not going to say, the only thing revolutionary really about him is how much of a revolutionary, of an asshole he was. So we're <laughs> just going to put that like, but he was criticizing the shit out of communist writers during the Browder era. So I think what he has to say about criticizing uh, specifically opportunism mm-hmm. as uh, from a writer's perspective is in light of him viewing what was going on uh, under Browder in the Communist Party. That's really fascinating. Say more about that. That's, that's an interesting idea. So basically, I'll, re- I'll read one of his quotes. It gets, basically gets this idea. Books should be about the people you know that you love and hate, not about the people you study about. If you write them truly, they will have all the economic implications a book can hold. So the idea is if you want to write well, you write what you care about. If you want to be a revolutionary writer, you need to care about the masses. That is first and foremost. Care about what you want to write about and then just write about whatever you want. So essentially, like get back to like Mao and content, like first and foremost, he goes at the top of the speech is – the writer's most important goal is to know the masses and to know what they are fighting for. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So study Marxism and proactively be involved in building revolution. And I think a, an interesting parallel could be exactly be made of, of Christian faith, right? Christianity is often made out to be 
to to care most deeply about our thoughts, our beliefs about some kind of metaphysics or some kind of thing called God, some way out there. But religion for us, a faith for us, needs to be about who, right? Who do we, who are we really caring about? Uh, our Christian faith needs to drive us towards the well-being of the people, the well-being of all non-human creatures, the well-being of the planet. So I, I think that's a really interesting and, and an excellent parallel between what we are to truly and deeply care about. And if we truly do, right, genuinely deep down, then materially and in our concrete relations, it will spell out. Mm. From a revolutionary communist perspective, what's the role of cultural revolution and the work of revolutionary artists in our struggle for the national liberation and proletarian democracy? And what is the relation to armed struggle? Chris, you had mentioned you wanted to talk about the dialectical relation between the superstructure and the economic base. Did you want to start us off there? Yeah, we absolutely can. Uh, I'll take base and then I'll I'll throw it over to somebody else for superstructure. The base simply means, you know, the basic economic um, relations of production, distribution. Uh, who makes the stuff? How do they make it? Uh, who reaps the profits? That kind of thing for all of society. And that's just my shorthand. And you all are welcome to add whatever you want to that. Uh, but superstructure is really where we're kind of living yeah. in this conversation. So what is superstructure? Basically, I know it's a weird way to put it. The superstructure is the liturgy of the base. It is the the culture, the mindset and actions that reinforce the economic structure underneath it. Um, why we say liturgy is because essentially your actions dictate your belief. Right. This is a Catholic understanding of what why we do liturgy. Your actual physical stance and physical actions dictate what you think about yourself in the world. So under capitalism, uh, it has dictated your behaviors, such as the school day is structured after the work day. Right. Literal physical material ways of reinforcing this idea that this economic structure is all there can be and all there is because it is all you know and is reinforced by your actions, regardless of what you believe in it or not. Uh, I know Zizek made very popular this, uh, this quote, this, this idea of um, this atheist thinker who had a horseshoe above his door and an interview, uh, an interviewer called him out and he's like, so as someone who's like such a proud atheist, why do you have a horseshoe above your door? He's like, oh, that's the beauty of it. It works even when you don't believe in it. So essentially, that is what the superstructure is, a culture that makes you believe in capitalism even without comprehending it. Hmm. So there's there's a deeper unconscious level to yeah. the superstructure. Yeah. So so the superstructure, if I can, you know, it's the realm of our cultural and political values, our, yeah. our principles, our ideas and institutions. Um, that dialectically sits perhaps upon the economic base, right? As Chris said, the, the actual relations through which all of the stuff we consume is produced through. The relations are capitalist relations, and it's also the means of production, the, the economic base. Uh, mm. But just to be clear, the, uh, the cultural revolution and the work of revolutionary artists, in my mind, is to step-by-step step develop the consciousness the thinking, right? The values of the people in light of two things. Number one, the actual and particular ideas of the target audience or community. And number two, the specific stage of a particular struggle. So it matters if we are in a particular stage of a struggle where we don't have a party. Welcome to the United States. Or perhaps you're you're decades into a protracted people's war and yeah. And cultural revolution is going to look very different if you already have a party, um, an army, and a democratic front. Or perhaps you're, I mean, no one today is listening in, in this situation, but perhaps, you know, like the uh, the Bolsheviks and the Chinese revolutionaries in their particular moments, um, the or cultural revolution will look differently if you've already established a proletarian democracy, right? A new democracy. Yeah. So it matters what particular stage of the revolution you are in. And I think I, I, I really just want to ground that, that first aspect as well, that cultural revolution and the work of revolutionary artists is to really be connected to real life, particular ideas 
of the people that we are trying to develop consciously, which means you have to go actually talk to people. Yeah, pro, you have to be proactive in organizing whatever, to whatever capacity that is. It has to be, it can't be passive. You have to engage with it. It has to, you have to come into conflict with ideas. Yeah, Sasan puts it, cultural revolution is the, the construction of a culture that provides the revolutionary class with the thoughts and motives that serve as an effective guide to action. Now, what is the specific role of the artist in that? I like the Tony Kata uh, Bimbara quote, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. There's two forms of this. One, there's art from the party. And this is, uh, I mean, read, read the speech uh, that we have linked because Mal goes in pretty concrete details of how to approach each subject in this. But essentially it's to communicate the party line um, and it's to communicate campaigns and programs. During the revolution, that is what is, that is kind of the heart and soul of it. Now, when you don't have a party, I would go back to that Ingalls, Ingalls quote, and it's to build class consciousness and show the defeatability of capitalism. And then a very important thing, which is something there's kind of a call to action right now. There's art for the party or art for your own ranks. And this is art that is developed for other revolutionaries to build um, a revolutionary spirit of sorts. Uh, but one of the things, like I'll give you an example with uh, the Irish. So if we get down to plays, they were the kings of plays, right? Uh, when the IRA in the, in the uh, early 20th century, after the, after the Civil War, they started promoting a program where they're like, we need to instill uh, a spirit that demonizes informants amongst our own ranks, right? So they held a, a huge propaganda about uh, demonizing the informant. Because if you're doing grassroots organizing, if you're doing um, word of mouth, like not these not large, especially when you're outpowered, your big uh, one of your biggest risks is the informant from the first and foremost. So analyzing where you are at in your struggle, finding those things, and I think the informant is a huge one on our own level, as well as the opportunist, but developing campaigns through your arts to demonize these actions that is art for the party. Or it could be for all people, but specifically targeted towards revolutionaries in the movement. And to ground this again back into the specific material conditions, or here's a quote by Mao, quote, revolutionary literature and art should create a variety of characters out of real life and help the masses to propel history forward. For example, there is suffering from hunger, cold, and oppression on the one hand, and exploitation and oppression of man by man on the other. These facts exist everywhere, and people look upon them as commonplace. Writers and artists concentrate such everyday phenomena, uh, typify the contradictions and struggles within them, and produce works which awaken the masses, fire them with enthusiasm, and impel them to unite and struggle to transform their environment. Without such literature and art, this task could not be fulfilled, or at least not so effectively and speedily. So again, what are the role? What's the role of cultural revolution and the role of revolutionary artists? It really is to develop that consciousness, awaken them step by step. Uh, if you're if you're too far out and advanced, then they're not going to connect to it. They're not going to really uh, see that as something that has something to do with their particular situation, their particular struggle. Or if you're tailing them, well, then you'll never contribute to the their development. You'll actually uh, contribute to the reproduction of their suffering, their exploitation, their subordination. Mm. Yeah. And as Christians and as communists, right, because all three of us are in this, uh, this little boat, we recognize that there is great unnecessary suffering in the world and that our life work must be given to the struggle to end it. So in what ways can Marxism, Leninism, Maoism help artists who truly want to love their neighbor and serve the people make revolutionary art as opposed to, as we called it, you know, liberal or bourgeois art? What are some of the ways that this revolutionary science, right, its, its philosophy, its methods can help artistic creators serve the people? Because I'm thinking, you know, maybe there's a preacher or a poet or a songwriter that's listening in and they have a huge heart for justice. So let's help 
uh, speak to how can Maoism help artists effectively and genuinely love their neighbor? Yeah. Uh, the two big ones that I see is the mass line and criticism and self-criticism. Again, with the mass line to reiterate, uh, well, if you want to give a specific, like an actual definition of the mass line before we jump into it. Okay, yeah. Well, the three part of the mass line is, well, everyone knows the two part, from the masses to the masses. Let's make that a little more complex. Let's get a little more detail in there. There's a three part understanding analysis of the mass line. And the first thing you do is you go to the masses and you actually collect the ideas of the people including the backward, the in intermediate, and the more advanced ideas. So you're gathering, you're collecting. Then you take it back to our little Maoist revolutionary factory. We, uh, we are thinking as our ideology is Marxism and as Maoism. And so we're engaging all of the ideas, these real specific concerns and, and, and thought processes of the people that we just talked to, literally at their doorstep or, or on their couch or um, at their car at work. Um, so we we collected the ideas. We're we're putting it through our little Maoist revolutionary factory, and we're uh, kind of concentrating them, f separating them. Again, this is very backward thinking. This is more intermediate. This is the more advanced comparatively. And then we're going to develop a program from that. So so we're not just coming up with a program abstractly, disconnected from the people, disconnected from where they really are, both both consciously and materially. No, we're actually taking. Uh, we're actually engaging the people where they are in both their real lived experiences and what's on their minds. And we're developing real programs that people can actually be organized around. Yeah. And the third thing is you return to the masses. You make sure your cadre is unified and understands this new program. Then you take it to the people and you make sure that the people understand it as their own program. This is their ideas. This is this is what they think. This is the most advanced ideas of the people that we are organizing. And the people must support their own program, else it's not going to work. So, that, so yeah. that's mass line. They could reject yes. it as well. Yeah, like that's, that's a very yeah. real possibility is that you think you've done all the right steps and then they reject the possibility. And then, no, you didn't do the right steps. You didn't yep. synthesize things correctly or hear what you needed to hear. In order to make effective revolutionary art, it has to be good. In order for it to be good, you must know your subject. And the mass line is the most effective revolutionary tactic of knowing your subject. The second one is criticism, self-criticism. Because there's a thing that happens in revolutionary art, and you will find this happen. It's a conflict between content and form. What you're saying and how you're saying it. As... The, the ideal form is to have those in perfect balance. You are communicating what you're saying the clearest and also the most skillfully. Criticism helps people call out when your art is shit. Essentially, Christianity is a very good example of this. When your art is so focused on just content that you produce such horrible art that actually detours people from your movement. On the other flip side, if you're... Uh, producing really, really quality art that is all, but has reactionary ideas. You, these are two flip sides of the thing. But one that I've seen happen more common than not is promotion of art because you believe in it or agree with it rather than if it's good. If I can jump in here, I think there's a, a few really good points here. First of all, you know, we named that that SICA, right? Scientific Investigation and yes. Class Analysis. This can help us really engage in the mass line so that our artistic creations, again, whether you're a graffiti artist or a preacher or a songwriter or a poet, uh, our art that we're producing is actually connected to and speaking to the lived realities of the masses of exploited and oppressed peoples. Because as we said at the very beginning of this conversation, we can't escape the class struggle. We can't escape the reality of colonialism and capitalism and patriarchy. And so we need to consciously choose a side. And so as we consciously choose this side of the masses of exploited and oppressed people, 
Maoism, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, is a revolutionary science that can, that can actually guide our work, uh, that that can enable us to know exactly who are we speaking to, and what what are their actual concerns, what's actually heavy on their heart, how can we actually um, and materially effectively develop their consciousness, develop not just their thinking but also their activity, their participation in their struggles locally and communally. Um, or perhaps at work or or against the landlord, right? Yeah. So so I think Ma- um, Maoism, on one hand, helps us do, it, it grounds our art materially and scientifically. Yeah. The second thing, as I hear you saying, is criticism and self-criticism, right? The, yes. the, the method of criticism and self-criticism, how this Maoist method can greatly contribute and develop our art. And on one hand, I can self-critique all day long. You know, my my closest friends and comrades, they know I'm pretty militant about self-critiquing uh, yeah. my actions, my thoughts, every every single part of my life. Um, but if I can bring another comrade or two or five into this space and say, hey, this is what I've uh, done. This is what I've created. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for some critique. Do you think this actually serves the people in this particular context um and they may say actually uh it's very unclear who your audience is or perhaps it's very unclear what what the ideas of the people were it's very unclear how this is actually going to reach the people that you think you're speaking to so criticism is so important and whether you're a christian or a comrade or an artist perhaps all three if you're listening into this that criticism is so fundamental to development, and we create, and we certainly have a culture that resists criticism, and self-criticism is is conflated with self-deprecation. We're not self-deprecating. We are, we are, we love ourselves. We love our neighbors. We love our community, and we are committed to developing our love for yeah. others and ourselves. And so, criticism and self-criticism is necessary for yeah. developing that kind of art. I mean, to kind of close out this kind of this section. One is the big question, who, who are you serving? Like, who does your art serve? Is a very practical question, such as who is your audience? Like literally who's at your galleries? Who's at your concerts? These are quite like full on, you have to, like you can visually see who your audience is. So it's a pretty good determiner of who you are serving is who is your audience. Like is, Beyonce, like like Beyonce for a second. I'm sorry, I have a lot of uh, coworkers and friends who 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 critique her. Her clothing line is so unaffordable to the masses of Black women, right? And the same thing goes for her her concerts. So try and go to a Jay Z concert. I can't afford it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, I personally I wouldn't go there just because of my own interests, my own ideology, but. But try and go to some people's concerts, and when when they're so expensive, you know who their art. It doesn't matter what the what they what they say, or, you know what what they talk about in their art. If they're selling it, I think that's a great point. If they're selling it only to people with a certain amount of money in their pocket, you know yeah. who their art really serves. Yeah, it, the content doesn't matter at that part at that point because that's form. A form is also how you present it. So form also, like there needs to be a revolution and also form. Uh, how you present it, how the show, in, how you interact with the show. A big question is like, if it's not working class, if you were call yourself a revolutionary artist and if there aren't working class people at visually seeing your art, you ask, why is that? Is it the price? Is it the location? Is it because it's only at a college? Is it because it's only in these like elitist petit bourgeois artist communities? Who are you trying to impress is the big question. Because you could say it's like, oh, well, it's working class art, but I'm also actually trying to impress Pitchfork, right? It's just like, there's a lot of questions you have to ask yourself and it's going to be, there's not a universal term for that, right? You, ha- you have to do this criticism, self-criticism in that aspect. My interaction with the revolutionary artist communities, some things I've seen that I just want to get out there that we should probably address and avoid. Now, this thing I mostly see in with white organizers coming into poorer communities, such as thinking that revolutionary art is a genre or aesthetic. Marxism is not a genre. 
just because you throw hammers and sickles on shit doesn't make it Marxist. Because why I see a lot of these organizations go into these communities and they're waving Soviet Union art. They're just promoting all this like art of the Soviet Union art or like mimicking art with it because they think revolutionary art has a distinct genre. It looks like Soviet Union art. It's like, no, no, no. Marxism is a tool that should reflect the, the art of your already existing community. Don't be forcing the Soviet Union pro- looking art into your Latino community. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Well, it, it's a clear indicator for me that they aren't doing the mass line. When they approach Marxism as an aesthetic and taking already preconceived notions of how other people have done it as their own. Yeah, so again, mimicking already existing, specifically like white European movements, I think is something that people need to really examine themselves on. Uh, your again, your art should reflect the art in your community. If you're an organization, that's just a big thing I've seen. Engage with the community. Engage with the art that is already in your community. That's just something that drives me up a wall. It's like, what is revolutionary art? It's like, it sounds like the Soviet national anthem. It's like, what the fuck are you doing? Hmm. I'm also guilty of this. That's why I'm so agitated by it. How, okay, here's a concrete example. Tell me what you think about this. When No Name stopped performing because it was just white people coming out to the shows and they said i'm not i'm not fucking with white audiences this is not who my music is for so they decided not to perform does that have any resonance in this conversation or do you think that's a I different think so. conversation like if it, it, you have to ask yourself who are you trying to serve if you were saying i'm trying to serve the black community and the black community is not who you're practically serving then yeah i the you should you take a step back and you look at it. It's criticism, self-criticism, mass line. Obviously, I don't know the exact details of that situation, so I'm not going to make any further comments, but you have to ask yourself that. If you're saying you're making art for the working class and the working class is not engaging in your art or your community is not engaging with your art, are you actually making it for your community? But you have to ask yourself, why is that? And that big question is why I can't answer for you. Know your subject, know your theory. Read and engage with the community. Write about what you care about. Because if you have to tell yourself, oh, I need to, I should be making more political art. If you are having a hard time convincing yourself to write political art, you yourself need to become more revolutionary, not your art. Yeah, that, that was great. And Chris, I didn't know that uh, about No Name. It was really interesting. Mm-hmm. And that was a great example, too. Did you all watch the uh, the documentary on YouTube, How Yukong, Yukong Moved the Mountains? Mm-hmm. No, huh. There's this episode about criticism and self-criticism where this, this guy who's a painter uh, brings this um, collective of, of women who are fisherwomen to critique his painting, and they just, like, give him the shit. They, they just destroy his art right in front of him, and he's like, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like a beautiful no. example. I don't know if it was staged or not, but, oh, it's just such a perfect. All right, to summarize all that we've talked about in this super-packed conversation, let's just reiterate. How should the revolutionary artist think about their relationship to the people? The single most important thing, like the primary thing as an artist and a revolutionary is your engagement. One, as an artist and your engagement with your subject. So as a revolutionary artist, your engagement with the masses in a proactive form is the single most important thing you can do. Yeah, in the talks at the Yenin Forum, Mao says specifically that you you know you can't help lead or develop anyone you haven't learned from first. I love that. I thought that was that was very poignant. So the first thing artists and creators need to do is actually learn from the people that they want to speak to and create for. As a pastor, that's a difficult lesson. Oh. Say more, Chris. Whenever, there are times whenever I think I have a lot to teach my my people mm. uh, without first learning from them. So that's a, a lesson I'm going to take home. Yeah. Well, it's the whole co- only by speaking for the masses can he educate them, and only by being the pupil can he be their teacher. Yeah, that's a great quote. That's a great quote. So this immersion, this linking ourselves is not just some kind of abstract idea. These are real relationships. And it's it's a very humbled posture that the revolutionary artist should 
um, approach the people that they're actually trying to develop, and it, right? Because because we love the people, and yet we ourselves and our neighbors and our coworkers and uh, the people across the world, we've internalized wrong ideas, right? Ideas that actually reproduce our suffering, reproduce our neighbor's exploitation, reproduce uh, the stranger's oppression. And that's not a moral judgment. That's just a materialist reality that both capitalism, colonialism, patriarchy, all these systems of exploitation and oppression, um, and specifically our ruling class here in the United States has, has imposed upon us. So in our, in our everyday living from, from the day we are born, we are born into a world that's teaching us ideas that actually hurt us and hurt others. And so out of love, for ourselves, out of love for our neighbors, out of a love for God's beloved creation, we want to combat our wrong thinking, combat our wrong ways, our, our wrong attitudes, um, and and ways of being in relationship. And so, the revolutionary artist, you know, when we approach, um, the first thing is to actually approach them as uh, as subjects to be learned from, not just to to develop. But ultimately, we are trying to develop. We're, we're trying to develop both thinking, our consciousness, and the actual activity, the 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 capacity of struggle of the people. And that can't happen without real relationships with the people that we're trying to organize. Absolutely. And if I can end us on a quote from Mao, quote, we should tell them that no revolutionary writer or artist can do any meaningful work unless they are closely linked with the masses, gives expression to their thoughts and feelings and serves them as a loyal spokesperson. Only by speaking for the masses can they educate them, and only by being their pupil can they be their teacher. If they regard themselves as their master, as an aristocrat who lords it over the lower orders— then no matter how talented they may be, they will not be needed by the masses and their work will have no future. So I think this whole conversation is about serving the people and serving the masses and loving our neighbor. I hope, and I hope this has been a, a really, a real blast of a conversation. I hope this, this discussion pushes listeners to a go read talks at the yin and forum on literature and art and if you're interested continue to develop your study both of marxism leninism maoism but also the revolutionary history of your own nation that you're listening in from and practice make sure it sounds good Mm. (laughs) make sure it sounds good And by the way, you know, as I mentioned in the intro, Dave is an artist. He makes music for our podcast. Go check out his work. Um, I love his stuff. Actually, I work out to his stuff. Uh, It's got a solid beat, great content. Um, I would say iffy on the form, but (laughs) no, um, it's phenomenal work. Dave, I really appreciate you, um, the, the art that you're doing your development both as a Christian spiritually and as someone who's studying revolutionary science. Appreciate you, my friend. You're awesome.